Welcome to the Lights Out Podcast. This is Chris Lights Out Lytle, and this is our journey to document the history of mixed martial arts. I have brought with me my friend, the MMA detective Mike Davis, and together we will preserve the history and hear some great stories from the world in the era of the no-holes ball. Thank you and enjoy. Welcome back to the Lights Out MMA History Podcast. I am Joey Venti. I'm with the host of the show, 50 Fight Club member Chris Lights Out Lytle and the MMA detective Mike Davis. If you're listening to the show, our guest today has had a profound effect on your life. Having a good idea is useless if you don't have a guy who can make it a reality. This man changed the world by transforming the ultimate fighting championship from a dream into a sport. His 2014 book, Is This Legal?, available on Apple, Barnes & Noble, and Smashwords, is arguably the most important book ever written on mixed martial arts. It's about to be made into a major Hollywood production expected to be released next year. He's got a serious uh, XM audio documentary about the UFC, which is recording this week for the 30th anniversary. He is a creator of the Ultimate Fighting Championship and a friend of the show. Welcome once again, Art Davey. Thank you, Anthony. You're welcome. Are truly a pleasure. Um, I, why don't we start with before we get into the questions? Obviously, I've I, I, I've got like a whole Star Wars type slew of things I'm going to be throwing at you for us nerds. Um, but why don't we start with your book? Uh, Is this legal? Um, I, I've read it cover to cover uh, on on multiple occasions, on two different occasions. It's incredible, and Sean Wheelock um, also helped pen this this project with you. Would you mind talking about your book first and foremost, and Sean Wheelock, if possible? Well, you know, I have been approached for a number of years after the UFC about doing a book, you know, based on my, my experience with the Gracies and with Semaphore, et cetera. And I had always turned it down. In fact, one of the guys I've been approached by is somebody I became good friends with over the years, uh, Frederico Lapenda who wound up basically copying the UFC format and taking it to the, to the Middle East, taking it to Europe, taking it to Japan. And he had brought me a number of uh, publishers and we could never seem to come up with uh, a concept to do a book or the price or the royalties, et cetera. So sometime around 2011, I get an email from Sean Wheelock and he approached me and I knew who he was because he was working at the time as a great commentator for Bellator, who's working with Jimmy Smith. And Sean said to me, Art, he said, I really want to do a book with you. And he said, I'm willing to write the book. He said, I have done a book on soccer when I was coming out of college. He was at ASU, Arizona State University. And he said, I'm going to write the book. So we talked uh, the early part of 2011. And in all fairness, uh, it, was, it was a while before Sean finally said to me, he said, you know, he said, I'm busy with my gigs and with my family. He said, I'll line up the publisher. He said, but I want to give you some good advice. He said, whether I'm writing the book or you're writing the book. He said, memoirs work or fail based upon the simple principle that you either don't make the mistake of taking bows of how great you are, or you've got a grudge against somebody who helped you back. He said, he said, you'll read a book by a guy, a wrestler or a pro athlete or a celebrity, and they're either, you know, taking the bow of how great they are and they want the audience who's reading the book to acknowledge that, or they basically want to settle a score with somebody who held them back. Sean said, don't do that. But Sean was going to start writing the book in uh, the early part of uh, 2013, and he sat down and I guess he got a bit of a block. So he called me back. He said, you know, he said, I don't think I can write this thing. But we had done some recordings and I had given him a ton of anecdotes about the first event. The Gracies, you know, Lou DiBella over at HBO, Jack McLean over at Showtime, Jay Larkin, people over at ESPN. So Sean said, you'll write the book. He said, let me edit the book. And that's exactly what we did. And in all <laughs> August of 2013, and February or March of 2014, that book got written. And Sean was an incredible editor. He would say to me, you know, that thing that you just wrote about in chapter four, that needs to be moved over in the chapter two. He was a great editor. And Sean encouraged me to tell the whole story. 
He said, give everybody credit. He said, don't, you know, get up on the, the you know, a, a, a position where you're going to, you know, blame somebody for this. He said, tell everybody everything that went on. He said, that's what people want to hear. So that's what we did. And Sean found 10 books in Kansas City. And they had been doing a lot of books on celebrities and athletes. And the book was published in July of 2014. And it's been a success ever since. I, I've, I've given a few away. Um, I've bought multiple copies of it. And I, I, I will tell you, let, let's talk about Sean Wheelock. He's the color comment, current color commentator with you know, our friend Chris Lytle um, for BKFC. But like you are who you hang around with. Like if you see a whole bunch of knuckleheads and you're the great guy, you're probably a knucklehead too. Yes. Look who look who Sean surrounds himself with. His ability to get things done and make things happen within combat sports, it's incredibly underappreciated or even unknown. I mean, he's somebody I admire as a commentator, and even more so as somebody that gets things done. Well, you have to remember, Shu, that that Sean is also a member of the Kansas State Athletic Commission. And his place there on that commission has given him an overview of MMA that a lot of people don't have. Because now he's looking at it from both sides, from being somebody involved in the sport and somebody who has to be involved with how the sport is regulated or sanctioned. So Sean's ability to understand the big picture is incredible. And, of course, his association with Chris Lytle, <laughs> a legendary uh, <laughs> and you got to remember that Chris is a guy who really understands combat sports. As I recall, I think Chris has had uh, he had um, he had 13, 31 fights in MMA. He had a professional boxing career. I think he had seven uh, w wins in boxing, and he's also fought in bare knuckle fighting. So you know, Lytle from the inside as a fighter has been one of the great welterweights in combat sports history. And uh, this guy, he, he's not just smart because he developed the UFC. He just knows his stuff. I mean, look how smart right. this guy is already. I'm just saying. Uh, and, our, you know, the the bad thing is I started fighting so long ago. Those are the things that are on record. I got a ton more fights than that. You know what I mean? I have a lot more boxing, a lot more uh, MMA. The bare knuckles legit. But, I mean, first of all, I want to thank you just for doing this again, man. It, it's such an honor. The reason I know we really wanted to do this, we've had a lot of the guys – I'm sure Mike already went over who, who fought in UFC one and just hearing their perspective, man, this being a 30 year anniversary, we had to come back and just find out even more um, riveted the first time, but it was just amazing to see. And now that I'm, I'm spending so much time with Sean, you know, we talk about this just often. Um, it's just been, been amazing. So we just have, have more questions and just more, more things that I want to know. Um, and I know, I know Mike's the same way. So we just really, yeah. I mean, you don't know how many people's lives you've affected. I was thinking about that today. We we're talking to Sean about it last night. You know, I, I came into the hotel that we were at and look right on ESPN was the UFC. I'm thinking, uh, I mean, look, kickboxing, uh, Muay Thai, um, all kinds of different sports. They've never, they've been around forever, but they've never been able to break through and get to that next tier. The UFC has, I mean, during COVID, it was the sport. I mean, it's unbelievable how big this thing has came. And that all came from your brain. It's amazing. Well, you know, Chris, I, I get a lot of credit that, that some of it I deserve and some of it I don't. I always tell the story. I always tell the story that, because uh, Sean likes to say, you know, I really didn't create MMA and he's right. Because what I really created in the beginning was a spectacle, and it was a style versus style tournament, and it was really based on the original pancreation, which had been in the Olympics for more than a thousand years, and it was no holds barred. So early on, when I hooked up with Horion Gracie, and I found Horion because there was no internet at the time, but I found him in the library. There had been an article that a, a sports writer named Pat Jordan had done in Florida. The name of the article was B.A.D. And it was about the Gracies and Horion and the Gracie Challenge. Horion was teaching out of his school in Torrance, California. And I actually wound up at an ad agency about three blocks away from the academy. So I went and looked up Horion. And what I found from the article was that he was willing, or somebody in his family was willing, to have a bout with somebody 
from either kickboxing or karate or tang sudo or taekwondo. They were open to that. Well, this was not a new idea. If you think about it, Bruce Lee and Enter the Dragon is the first <clears throat> martial arts superstar in a movie about style versus style tournament. It was not a new idea. In fact, when I met Horion, he had been approached by a guy that I met named Pat Strong, who was in a movie with ba Bang Su Han, the great uh, Hapkido fighter. And Pat had come to Horion with the idea of doing something called the World Fighting Championship. Well, it went, never went anywhere. And I said to Horion, this crazy challenge, have you ever found anybody that was willing to do the Gracie challenge for money? He said, no. I said, didn't you get in touch with Benny the Jet or Kides? Oh, <laughs> Benny and I had talked. He said, but Benny didn't either have or didn't want to put the $100,000 up at risk. I said, Horion, did you have $100,000 to lose? And Horion said, no. <laughs> I said, well, here's the problem with the Gracie challenge. <laughs> and I said, if you think about it, in 1975, Muhammad Ali versus Antonio Inoki points out one of the great failures of a style versus style match in that if you let the fighters determine what the rules are, it's going to get screwed up. You can't let the fighters determine what the rules are. So I had been thinking about a tournament and I had been thinking about ancration with basically no rules except no biting or eye gouging. And Hori had said to me, he said, you know, I don't know all of what's out there. He says, I wouldn't be the, the booker or the matchmaker. He said, that'll be your job. He said, but how do we do this? I said, I figured out that there's one state that doesn't have an athletic commission that will allow <laughs> them for fighting. It's Colorado. And the, the true story is, guys, in the early days, when it came down to approaching, you know, Lou DeBella at HBO, you know, uh, Gene Larkin over at Showtime, or Michael Oresco at ESP, and they said, hey, is this thing legal? How, you know, how could this be legal? I had already put a deposit down on the arena, McNichol Sports Arena, which was the home for the NBA of the basketball nuggets there in Denver. I already had a deposit on that place because I knew that, that there was no athletic commission which was restricting technical fighting. So Horian said, you pick the fighters. And in those days, I used to look in the back of all the martial arts magazines. All the phone numbers and the fax numbers were there for all of the karate outfits in Europe, in Asia, and in North America. And I was sending faxes to everybody. We even put a little ad in Black Belt magazine. So early on, I got a lot of response, but I got you know people who didn't really want to put up their reputation when I explained what the rules were. <laughs> You know, I would explain what the rules are. I said, you know, in fact, I actually wrote the fighter agreement and I had my attorney bless it. And wise guy that I was, I put in the agreement that the fights could end, you know, by, uh, you know, you could, you could tap out or you could throw a towel or the fights could end by knockout or by death. <laughs> by death. At one point, the New York Times had gotten a hold of that fighter agreement and they read that. The next day, they did an editorial. Debt is cheap at $14.95. <laughs> so so that, uh, that, was, right. that was the early, that was the early uh, pushback that we got. But I was going out and knocking on everyone's door. I tried to get a hold of, uh, you know, Frank Dukes. Who yeah. I heard, right? Frank Dukes supposedly had been in a real tournament, either in Thailand or in the Caribbean. He didn't want to talk to me. So early on, I was knocking on everybody's door, and a lot of people didn't want to come to the party. So, but, but you did go after the guy who threw Frank Dukes over the table in, in, uh, in, in Spain, right? Chris, that's yeah, a true story. And what happened there was Orion wanted to put one of his brothers in. And, of course, I figured it's going to be Hickson, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I had actually, in meeting the Gracies, had rolled with Orion. And Orion said to me, why don't you come over every Tuesday night? I'll give you a private lesson. You'll learn something about this. I had not wrestled in high school. I knew nothing about grappling. But every Tuesday night, I went and rolled. The guy who had a class before me on Tuesday night was film director and screenwriter John Milius. John Milius, who made a star out of Arnold Schwarzenegger 
and Conan the, the barbarian. So I would sit, I would talk to John after a class. We would go over to the juice bar in the academy and we would have a smoothie. And then we'd go back and talk to Horian. And Horian said, you know, what are we going to do? I said, we're going to do a tournament and we're going to do it in Colorado. Now, Horian had and done some seminars with Chuck Norris and with um, and with a uh, karate name in California. And he was the sponsor of the IKF, the International Kickboxing Federation. Their heavyweight champ was Zane Fraser, who had been a basketball player at ASU, where Sean went to college. I didn't know that. And Zane, Zane was doing a tournament or, or a martial arts show up in Pasadena. And I went up there to talk to him. When I got there, there were cops everywhere. And when I came in the door, people said to me, who are you? I said, well, I'm here to talk to Zane Fraser. Oh, he's over here talking to the police. I said, what happened? He said, he and a guy named Frank had a shoving match, and he threw Frank, Frank Dukes over the table. So I finally got a hold of Zane. I said, Zane, I came here. Frank Trejo wanted me to meet you. Frank has done seminars with Horian. He tells me you would be a good guy for this. He said, Mr. Davey, he said, I'm in. Take my hand. And I said, you just threw Frank Dukes over the table? I said, you're in, baby. <laughs> That's all I said, Frank Dukes. Good story. So, Art, we, we started this about your book, and you'd mentioned Hickson's name. Just so everybody, just so everybody listening can kind of understand just how honest Art Davies' book is and just how direct it is, why don't you let everybody know, because I've read it, how come Hickson was not in UFC 1? Hickson was definitely the family champion. Everybody told me that the best street fighter was Helson, but Helson would use a bottle or a brick on the street if he needed it. <laughs> That's Hickson not going to work. Only, yeah, Hickson would only do jujitsu. On the other hand, Orion and Hickson in the same room was electric because it was a tremendous friction. But Orion discovered that Hickson had been taking students out and teaching them over at his garage in Torrance. It happened twice. When it happened a third time, Orion basically said to me, there's no Hickson for the event. Wow. I said, I said who's it going to be? He said, it's going to be Hoyce. He said, your kid brother, Hoyce? <laughs> I, I knew that Hoyce had a driver's license, but he had, he had no uh, checking account. Mm. He had no credit card. And he lived in a small room over the Gracie garage. And his, his roommate was, was a, a piranha in a six-sided fish tank. Once a week, Hoist would go to the, to the pet store and get a bag of goldfish. <laughs> so I said to Horian, Hoist is a kid. He's 28 going on 18. Horian said, he'll look great and he'll be like Bruce Lee. I said, he doesn't weigh more than 175 pounds. And he said, Horian said, if I know you, you're going to be bringing in big guys. Well, I was trying to get trying to get uh, James Bonecrusher Smith. Oh, nice. Yes. Leon Spinks. Mm. I was trying to get a sumo wrestler from Japan. And early on, I had seen a video in Horion's office. Pedro Sauer had gotten Hickson together with Mark Schultz. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Just so everybody understands, that wrestling match between Schultz and Hickson mm -hmm. took place before UFC won. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. I, I wasn't sure whether it was in 91 or 92, but Pedro Sauer had set it up either at uh, either at the Brigham Young University or at Pedro's Jiu-Jitsu School in Salt Lake City. Brigham Young. And I sat there and watched, Mike, I watched the tape for 25 minutes. It took Hickson 20 minutes to get Mark's arm and make him tap. And for me, it was like, wow. I went, oh, my God. The guys that I got to get into this event eventually are the wrestlers. They they maybe don't know all the holes and the chokes of jiu-jitsu, but they know how to do a single leg and a double leg takedown. They understand ground grappling. But, Watching that video, Mike, was a revelation to me. So, so Art, Chris, I apologize. So, U.S. UFC or uh, the U.S. Olympic judo member Mike Swain was he not allowed to fight in UFC one? I don't ever remember talking to Mike Swain about UFC one. Okay. That didn't, I think, came later. I had tried to get, I had tried to get uh, wrestlers out of University of Iowa from the Great Olympic Wrestling Ooh. there, and I could never get them to return my call. It's in the book. 
So, you know, I, I, until, until Phyllis Lee came and brought me Dan Severin, I was determined to find a wrestler. And Severin helped me open the door, helped me open the door to Don Fry, helped me open the door to, uh, to, to you know, Mark Coleman. Uh, Coleman, Mark Coleman, Randy Couture. And later I got Schultz and Kevin Jackson, both of them gold medals in the UFC. But you, in the first UFC, Mike Swain was not a factor. I don't remember trying to chase him down and get him. I couldn't get him. There was a lot of people who I called and I couldn't get them to return the call. Let me throw some names. Gokor. Was he one Chavikian. of them? Gokor Chavikian came later because he was a student of Judo Jean LaBelle. Correct. Now, That's Mike, here, Mike, here's the problem with Judo Jean LaBelle. I said to Horian, Horian, what are we going to do about a referee? And Horian said, let me think about it. I said, what about Jean LaBelle? I said, he was the referee for Ali and Oki in Japan. And Horian said, nope, stop right there. I said, what's wrong with Gene? He said, I've been on a, on a TV set, Heart to Heart, the TV series with Gene LaBelle. He said, the two of us in the same room, it's, it's explosive. He said, I went to his academy once, he had a couple of his black belts. He said, Gene and I, he said, you'll never get him. And he said, I don't want him. Ah. So that, and believe me, Gokor, I wanted to get Gokor and it came later. I asked Gokor twice, but I could never get him to the UFC. Got to get a charge. I'll be right back. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So let, let's talk about some other people that have been rumored. Ernesto Hoost. Yes. I, Mike, I was determined to get a really good kickboxer. And while Zane Fraser was the International Kickboxing Federation super heavyweight champ, I went into a gym and watched him kick in the bag. And I'm thinking to myself, he's an American kickboxer. He's used to having eight kicks above the waist. Otherwise, it's illegal in America. What I wanted was a Muay Thai kick fighter, and I knew I needed to go to Holland. I needed to go to the Chakariki gym or the, the, the Maguro gym, Tom Haring's gym or Jan Plas's gym, and that's who I called. And in getting Jan Plas on the phone, I wanted, I wanted Ernesto Hoost. I wanted Peter Arts. And Jan Plas said to me, Arts, he said, how much money do you got? I said, what do you mean? He says, you're going to have to come up with an appearance fee for arts. He said, it would break your budget. I said, look, there's $100,000 that we're putting up for UFC one. The winner is the ultimate champion. He gets 50000 Number two, the runner-up gets 15000 I said, the losers at every stage get either five, two, or one. He said, you won't be able to afford arts or Peter, Peter Hoots, uh, uh, Ernesto Hoost. But he said, I've got a guy. He said, here in Holland, he says, it's perfect. I said, who? He said, his name is Gerard Gordeaux. He said, if you run a rave or you run a house of a brothel or you're, a, you're, a, you're a, a, a loan shark and nobody pays you, he said, the guy you hire on the street to collect <laughs> is Gerard Gordeaux. I said, I love this guy. So I got Gordeaux to come in for no appearance fee. <laughs> And he was one of the three fighters that I went personally to the airport to pick up. And I, when I first met him, he said to me, I said, what about you on the street in Holland? He said, on the street in Holland, he said, I work. Uh, he said, I very rarely get into a fight with my hands. I said, why? He said, everybody knows what I can do with my hands and my legs. He said, I've got a 32 Mauser pistol in my back pocket and I keep a straight razor in my sock. <laughs> he said, I don't worry about getting in a fight on the street. I love this guy. He was perfect. And of, course, and of course, Mike, then I then I decided in setting up the matches that week, I had to get the best grappler up against the best kicker puncher. So all week long, up until Thursday, I was adjusting the matches so that I could end up with Boyce, who I thought, or Gordo, or, uh, or Ken Shamrock. So I, I wanted to match them up in the semifinals to see who the best grappler was. But I knew that it was going to be Gordo at the end, the and best kicker puncher. That's amazing. Um, I, I don't think people realize how how different could the world have been in, in, in MMA if if Ken Shamrock had won that fight. Because when you look at it, I mean, on paper he really should have won that fight. When you look at it now, looking back, I mean, he had the skills. He had knowledge. Did he just take hoist to? Did he think who is this guy with a gi on? I'm gonna kill. What happened? How did? I, looking back, I think he should have won. What happened? 
I had gotten a call from the about the ad in Black Belt from Scott Sack, who was in the Lions' den, and Scott called me up and he wanted to go in the UFC. And I talked to him for a while, and he finally said, "Mr. Davy," he said, "I don't think you need me." He said, "I think you need my coach, my teacher, and my trainer." I said, "Who's that?" He said, "Ken Wayne Shamrock." I love the name already. That name goes <laughs> up on, on a marquee. Ken Wayne Shamrock. So I got Ken on the phone, and I had looked up the scene that he has done wrestling and pancreas in Japan. And you've done pancreas, Chris. Oh, yeah. You, yeah. you know pancreas. So I, and I said to Ken on the phone, I said, Ken, this is a this is a shoot. This is not a work. Yeah. He, I said, you know the difference. He said, well, he says, everybody says it's going to be a shoot. So the true story is the night of the event, the first bout when I had Rod Gordo up against the sumo wrestler, Taylor Tooley. And Gordo, in 26 seconds, kicks Taylor Tooley. Knocks teeth out. Teeth out. Teeth. Yeah. And then he hits him with the right hand. He opens up cuts on the eye. And I'm back in the dressing area, and I'm looking up at the monitor. Who do I see standing right behind me is Ken Shamrock. I look over my shoulder, and Ken goes like this. It's a shoot. It's a shoot. He went like this, finally. He didn't believe me until he took that first bout. And he so, me, based upon that week and the press conference, that Hoist Gracie, he said to me, the guy fights in karate pajamas. <laughs> He's never had a pro fight, which was true. Hoist had never really had a professional fight. Wow. He'd never been in pink race. He'd been in jujitsu matches. So had Horian, so had Hickson. But Shamrock figured, this kid is an amateur. Shamrock went into that bout figuring, I can beat this guy. He was stunned to get his ankle locked. Stunned. Well, Never I mean, got over and, it. And then, I mean, a lot of people don't realize he had a, he flew like straight over from Japan. He had like a fight on Monday and came back and fought Friday or Saturday. I was like, what? You can't do that. How do you not? I, it's, it, the jet lag alone had to be terrible. Chris, you're exactly right that of all the fighters, I picked up three at the airport. The guy who comes in last to the event on Tuesday from Fukuoka in Japan is Ken yeah. Shamrock. He'd been in Pank Race up against uh, Minoru Suda, whoever, Saturday night. So he came in, and I said to him on Tuesday morning, I saw him there at, at, the, uh, at the, uh, the, uh, the hotel in the lobby. I said, how you feeling? He said, no problem. He said, I'm ready. Still figuring that it's a work. And yeah. he, he, he keeps working me, saying, Mr. D, keeps calling me Mr. D. Mr. D. You're going to tell me what, at what point who's supposed to win and who. I said, no, 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 no. It's all a shoot. <laughs> it would have been different if Ken had been able to beat him. Yeah. I mean, well, Chris, let, let's, let's talk about the elephant in the room. We've had Zane Frazier and Art Jimerson on, and even Ken Shamrock to a certain degree. And they said that the Gracies were following the fighters around, even with videotapes for the pre-fight workout in order to study them. Did you, were you privy to any of those conversations like Big John McCarthy going into Arch Emerson's room and scaring him about what an armbar was? Mike, that's a very good question. Let me answer it. Uh, what I did know was this. Number one, they kept Hoyce away from me all week long. They had him in a hotel room and Horion had paid for another conference space on his own, out of his own pocket, and they brought mats up from Torrance. They had mats there, mm. and McCarthy was rolling with Hoyce, and Helson was rolling with Hoyce, and I had heard that they were following the other fighters and doing some filming. I never caught them doing it, but I had heard that they were doing that, and they were studying it. Now, McCarthy at one point, I think it was on Wednesday afternoon, he was in the gym and he was rolling with Art Jimison. And he said to Jimison, he said, show me what you're going to do. So Jimison's got up front. McCarthy does a double leg takedown and takes him to the mat. He mounts him, he gets on top of him, and he puts his big fist in his face. He said, what are you going to do now? <laughs> Jimison got scared. Later on that night, he muted me in my hotel room. He said, I don't want to go into the event. Now, Remember that Jimerson and Taylor Tooley were the only two fighters that got paid an appearance fee for UFC 1. Not Bordeaux, not Shamrock, not Hoist. Jimerson got $17,000. I couldn't get, I couldn't get, uh, you know, uh, I couldn't get James Bone 
pressure Smith. I couldn't get, uh, you know, Spinks. heavyweight champions like, you know, before Ali. I had to pay Jimison $17,000. Semaphore was not happy about that. And I had to pay $6,000 to get Bela Cooley. I had found him through the American Amateur Sumo Association, John Jocks. And he told me, he said, this is guy is Makoshita class. It's like brown belt, low black belt in sumo. I said, well, isn't he doing sumo anymore in Japan? He said, no, he got kicked out. I said, why? <laughs> he said at a press conference, he pushed a reporter into a plate glass window and it broke. And oh. they banned him from sumo. I said, what is this guy like? He said, on the streets in Oahu, in Hawaii, if he gets into a fight on the street, his brothers know him, just pick a guy up and throw him into a plate glass window into a store. <laughs> I said, I love this guy. There was a guy who thought he was going to win. Shamrock thought he was going to win. And Taylor Cooley was absolutely convinced at 420 pounds that he would pick anybody else up. He had asked me before the event, Taylor Cooley, can I throw someone out of the octagon? And I said, absolutely, yes. <laughs> Well, 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 Chris, here, how about we interviewed Gerdo, and he said that during the pre-fight rules meeting, everybody's arguing, and Orion's telling everybody what they can and can't use. He said he didn't care. He was just smoking a cigarette and, and hanging out. You, as a promoter, seeing one of your athletes with a cigarette in his mouth, you know, the night before the event, was it concerning to you? Not at all, and I'll tell you how that again, you got, you know, pasted into my memory is that every time that he got injured, I remember that he had a broken hand and he had Taylor Tooley's teeth in his foot. <laughs> and, and, my, and, and my doctor uh, there in Denver was using the tweezers to take the piece of the tooth out of his foot. And there's Bordeaux smoking a cigarette and talking to me. And I said, Rod, how you doing? He said, no problem, Mark Davey. That was his favorite expression. No problem, Mark Davey. I, I love this guy. This guy was a street fighter. I love this guy. I knew. And there he is going into the last bout. And he's the, one, he's the only guy who's really injured. Really. Yeah. I, I, loved it when, I loved when we talked to him. He, he is a true fighter. I mean, not necessarily. I mean, he, he's just a guy who, 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 you know, hardcore, didn't care about anything. He said people were arguing about rules. And he goes, look, who cares about the rules? You guys came to fight or not. You, if you don't, if you care about the rules, you didn't train hard enough. Just come in and fight. Shut up. Chris, the big problem we had at, at the fighters meeting, and it's in the book, is that temporarily I had said, Hori, I had created something called the IFC, the International Fighting Council. I still have those business cards. I was the promoter, and Hori was going to be a commissioner. We get into the fighters meeting, and Hori on his own, sitting in front of the, of the chalkboard, he starts to talk about the things you can't do. He doesn't want the fighters to wrap their knuckles. This was, this was never part of the rules. This was I had never told any of the fighters this. Well, two guys objected. One of them is, is R. Jimison. He said, I'm a boxer. He said, I got to wrap my knuckles. Yeah. And, and, and Zane Fraser said the same thing. Orion said, well, maybe you can wrap it. Maybe it's going to be like an inch below the knuckles. And I'm thinking, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> at one point, I just, you know, and, and now I'm losing control. I'm standing there up at the chalkboard in front of the, the fighters meeting. The guy who saves the meeting is Taylor Tooley. He's sitting in the back of the room with his brothers and his cousin. He stands up. I had asked the fighters all to sign a release, which said that they understood that there are no rules, and we accept that. Taylor stands up. He says, I've already signed this thing. He slaps it down on the table. He says, anybody wants to party, I'll see you tomorrow night. <laughs> Even the Gracie started to clap. Every, the room broke up, and that was the end of the meeting. Taylor Tooley saved UFC one. Wow. He, he, Chris, I'll even further that. If you watch the Taylor Tooley fight against Gerdo, it's, it's, you know, 30 seconds long. Gerdo is arguing like, yes. no, no, no. This fight's not over. This <laughs> fight just started. Taylor Tooley. Let me tell you something, man. P people kind of dumped on the early guys that may have, you know, really got cracked hard or were quick right. finishes. Taylor Tooley's a man. He's an yes. absolute savage. And I respect him. Yes. And, you know, he was very, he really wanted to win. And he didn't really want that. In fact, I talked to his brother, so did Horian. And you'll see us there in, in the octagon. And uh, we're talking, we finally decided on two referees from Brazil, Joao Bejeto and Elio Vigio. Vigio. Now, Elio Vigio, you can look it up. He didn't have a good night. He didn't have a good night. Well, not only that, years yeah. later, I looked it up. 
the guy who had been in charge as police commissioner in Rio de Janeiro, Delio Vigio. He was police commissioner. He was also in charge of part of the civilian movement that got rid of Django Goulart, the leftist, in 1964, when they installed a military coup. Elio Vigio had been a black belt street fighter with the Gracies in Brazil, but he and Joao Bahetto came there with both of them feeling that they had to lend some rules to it. And Joao Bahetto basically stopped the fight, as you know, between Taylor Tooley and Gerard Gordon. It was, in fact, after the UFC won, the decision that Bob Marowitz made unilaterally is no more Brazilian referees. That was it. <laughs> no more. That was it. Finished. Minuti. But I found out years later that the guy who had been involved with some very tough stuff in Brazil was Elio Vigio. He had been police chief in Rio de Janeiro. I years later, would run into Brazilians who would say to me, Arturo, can you put in a good word for me with Senor Vigio? Because <laughs> to be a very bad man on the street in Brazil for real. Just so everybody can understand Vigio, we asked Babalu, like, why were these guys so respected? And Babalu said, Vigio would, like, you know, in, in terms of just, like, why were they always so respected? Why were they referees? And he said when they weren't referees, it was pandemonium. It was chaos. It was everybody arguing over rules. It was, like, a whole bunch of, essentially, kids on a playground talking about you know, what rule is this, that? He said, Vigio is so feared that all of us shut up because we knew if we disagreed with him, we'd be lucky if we only went to jail. <laughs> Vigio had a reputation of being yeah. a no holes barred yeah. fighter. He had yeah. done bouts against other styles. Yeah. Uh, and he was, and I believe, and, and Joao Bejeto at the time was working on something called Lute Libre American in Rio in which was the UFC rules. So he came there, the UFC, he was recruited by Horion to be the referee for UFC one. And he came there with the idea in his head that the no rules thing that our Davey wanted to do, he would, his on his own, would decide when to end the fight. They wanted that latitude. And remember after UFC one, when we finally brought in Big John McCarthy and Big John and I knew each other from the academy, we were both blue belts in 1992. And wow. John kind of said to me, I will only be a referee. At some point, I have the latitude to stop a fight to, to protect the fighter's health. So basically what McCarthy finally added and the rules we finally added by UFC 15, which eventually became the unified rules of MMA. Well, we, we, we had to do those because we were under tremendous pressure from the public and the media, the New York Times, uh, you know, Senator John McCarthy. Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, we were we were it was being called human cockfighting. You have to remember that UFC nine, I was supposed to fine any of the fighters who punched with a closed fist a hundred dollars for each punch. And when I didn't do that, and the judge got a chance to see the video on Monday, he called up the chief of police, and he said, "Arrest our Davy." <laughs> I had already left the night before back to California. The UFC did not return to the state of Michigan for 17 years. Ooh. You have to remember that the early UFC, we were a banded event, and what we were doing was considered illegal. Until Mississippi sanctioned us in October, November of 1997, basically we were doing these things on the run. That's fantastic. Art, UFC 2, you have two Dutch fighters in UFC 2, Free Kamaker and Remco Pardew. Um, both of them trained with Gerard Gerdeau. Was there a reason you allowed two people in from the same camp, or were you unaware that? No, let me tell you the story on Freik Hamaker. Freik. Freik Hamaker ran a brothel in Amsterdam. He, 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 he ran whores. And I wanted Gerdeau to come back to UFC 2. And Gordeau said, now, nah. he said, I got my $15,000. I had fun. I'm done. He said, but I'm going to get you a tough Dutchman. He said, he's as tough as I am on the street. That was Frank Hamaker. Now, I have been trying to get a Mike Swain to represent judo. But who do I get in Europe is Remco Pardew, who was terrible. So that's why I wound up with two fighters from Holland for that, for that event. And you remember, I ended up with a fighter from, from, Fran, from Spain uh, who'd won the... Uh, the, uh, the, the title of uh, the, the Indonesian martial art, uh, Penjak Salat. 
okay. in, in Jakarta. And I had brought him in because I couldn't get him in UFC one. There were a lot of people who turned me down for the first two shows. And after the success of the UFC one and two, then it was easier for me to pick up the phone. Now people that, are to me. That's what I was wanting to say. After the first one, was it a lot easier to get the second one or was that still hard? Because I figured maybe he, people saw the first one, understood it, and go, I want to be part of it. Was it still hard after the first one? No, you know, Chris, a lot of tough guys like you started to show up. I started, People looked at what we were doing and said, you know, I want to prove what I can do. Now, the problem with UFC 2 is on my own. Unilaterally, I decided to do a 16-man tournament so that the winner would have to fight four bouts to crown the, the ultimate fighting champion. And when Bob Marowitz didn't come to the show from Semaphore, and people who were really funding Semaphore Entertainment, Bertelsmann's Music Group in Frankfurt, Germany. Now, Bertelsmann's had hired Madonna and Michael Jackson. They were a big name in the music business. They weren't at UFC 1. When they came to UFC 2 and they saw Pat Smith throwing elbows at poor Scott Morris from that karate studio in Denver, in, uh, in Dallas, I went into the truck and the guys from BMG had their hands <laughs> covering their face. They couldn't look. They couldn't look. And 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 and, uh, and and Mike, our uh, our director, uh, was 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 doing replays of the Pat Smith fight, bloody, because their butts opened up with the elbows above and below both eyes. The guys from Bertelsmann's and Bob Morrow was now at the event for the first time seeing how bloody this event really is. In in a way, UFC two was more of a shock to the martial arts community. And you got to remember that one of the things that I wanted for UFC one because you wouldn't. You wouldn't go with, uh, you know, Judo Jean LaBelle. I wanted Chuck Norris to be at the yeah. event. Ooh. You know, UFC 2 is probably the most savage oh, MMA event brutal. ever held on United States soil. Ever. Brutal. Yes. yes. Ever. Yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Pardo, when Pardo throws those elbows, oh, I mean. Orlando Wheat. What about Orlando Wheat? I mean, Orlando, Pardo got him Orlando, too. Orlando Wheat came to me. I knew that he had born in France. And he had become a champion in Bangkok. He was the right size. He was about he was about uh, Chris's size, maybe five eleven, maybe one hundred seventy five pounds. And I knew he could kick. I watched him in the gym, and I can't wait to put him up against somebody like you know Marco Huis, who wasn't yeah. used to getting kicked in the legs. You know, so Orlando Wheat was a natural. Uh, you know, there were a lot of guys who said no to UFC one and then came to UFC two. But after UFC two, now who everybody came forward, you had to say to yourself. And I afford to be, be, you know, to be knocked out that way. They're going to be throwing elbows and knees. At <laughs> <laughs> UFC three, when Hoist Gracie bows out, and you know, in the ring after getting his name announced, no bell, obviously no contest on his record. Kind right. of strange. Um, the rumor was because Kimo was celebrating so hard that he was made to write a letter to Hoist Gracie, like apologizing to him. I don't remember that. Okay. I don't remember that. The funny story is, Mike, is that after UFC 3, the guy who shows up at the Gracie Academy wanting jujitsu lessons is Kimo Leopoldo. And <laughs> Horian calls me. I said, who? I said, who's there? He said, Kimo's here. I said, what does he want? He wants to take lessons. He wants the private lessons. I said, sign him up. Yeah. Orion said, I'm not signing him up. I said, why? He said, he's the enemy. I said, what are you, fucking crazy? That's the greatest compliment you could be getting. Yeah. Sign him up. He didn't want to sign him up. But I, yeah, never, got, got, he, I never remembered that letter. That he wrote. I don't believe he, that was a letter written about that. That's cool. That's cool. He got he got smart after that. The next time I saw him fight, he had his hair cut. He yes. grabbed his hair and controlled him with his hair. So he's like, hey, yes. shave him exactly. head. Yeah. Do you, do you think it was a little strange, like him walking in with the cross, as well as him preaching the, the word of Jesus Christ, you know, so you can donate him money and he can beat people up? Was that a little, a little off? Mike, I got to tell you the interesting story about that. Kimo walks into my office one morning with Joe San. They drove up in a convertible Porsche 911 in orange. They were both bare chested and they come into my office and they're yelling. And Joe's yelling very loud. I want to talk to that art, Davey. So my receptionist, uh, Sherry, came in. And Sherry came in. She says, there's some guy out here crazy. You could have talked to him. 
Well, I came out and Joe said, he said, I'm a preacher. He said, my constituency is ex-cons. He said, I'm a preacher of Jesus Christ the Lord. And he said, one of my people that I'm saved is Kimo Leopoldo. Kimo didn't say a word to me in the office. I stood there with a bare chest, 260 pounds, 55 pounds, <laughs> and muscle, huge, huge trapezius muscles that started at his ears and went out of his shoulders. Didn't say a word, but Joe was screaming. Now, I early on, Carthy said to me, he said, Art, you find the guys with charisma more interesting than any I know you're trying to find the best fighters. He said, but you like guys who are colorful. Well, early on, and I've said this to people in interviews, I felt that what we needed to do was to not be afraid of letting colorful people in. So Joe Son shows up with chemo in Charlotte, and my 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 assistant Kathy Kidd says, they've got some big thing wrapped up. It looks like it might be a it might be like a like a stair climber, all wrapped up in paper with duct tape. So I went and said, Joe Sonny, so what is that? He said, oh, he says, it's just a stair climber. It was a cross. And they, <laughs> they, unveiled, they, un they unveiled it in the dressing room that night. Bob Myrowitz, sitting that night next in the octagon, said to me, what's that? I said, I don't know. I said, but it's, when they brought it to the, to the side of the octagon and the audience went wild, I thought, believe me, that's relevant. I understood that there were elements of what WWE was doing. That we needed to pay attention to. Remember that the WWE is the greatest morality theatrical company in America. Every week they stage a play: the good guys against the bad guys, the heels against the baby faces. I understood that. Chemo, I, I couldn't have invented chemo. He's perfect. Hank Abbott. I was waiting to find the Hank Abbott. You know, look like a hell's angel. You know, perfect. I always felt that was a big part of what we were doing. We were in the entertainment business. Yeah, it was a, a lot of cartoon type characters. And they, Harold Howard, that's one of my favorites. Harold Howard from Canada, yes. Yep. Yeah, one of my favorites. Yep. UFC 4, was there hesitation allowing Ron Van Cleef into that tournament? Well, only on Semaphore's part. When I proposed Ron Van Cleef, the Black Dragon, and I had movie clips that I sent to New York, and I said, you know, this guy has been in Black Belt Magazine. Everybody in the martial arts sort of knows who he is. He was one of the first African-Americans ever to be featured on the cover of Black Belt. Now, Semaphore said to me, he's 51 years old. So Ron is running in the New York City Marathon. And he, a week before the marathon, I sent him into the Semaphore offices. And I said, go in there and meet him. Take off your shirt. Do some moves. Show them what you can do. He ran in the marathon in place. And then Semaphore said to me, all right, he's 51, but God, the guy's in incredible shape. All right, let's put him in. There was wow. that hesitation, Mike, not mine. Hmm. UFC 5 was Horry and Gracie's last show. Did, did you have a feeling that he wanted out? Why, why? How did that all go down, in your opinion? Well, at one point, Bob Myrowitz came to me and said, I'd like to buy you guys out. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, he says, I'd like to buy you out and keep you on as the, as the book or match maker, uh, you know, the UFC commission, whatever. He said, but you know, Horian and I in the same room, so we don't get along. So well, you can't buy one of us out. He says, it's our promotion. We're a Denver uh, limited liability company. You can buy it, you know, you can buy the company. You can't just buy one of us. Now, I went and told Horian about that. I said, Horian, you know, Bob really wants to own this thing. Now, remember, by UFC 5, we were starting to get a lot of pushback. Brian Gumbel on ABC is following what Brenda Payne says about human cockfighting. And the New York Times says death is cheap for $14.95. So there was a lot of pressure. And I knew it. Now, I said to Horion, you're telling me that you, is Hoist available for UFC 6 in Casper, Wyoming? And I couldn't get a straight answer. I said, what about Hickson? We had a meeting with Hickson in the WOW office. And Elio Gracie came in from Brazil and Hickson asked for a million dollars. <laughs> He's getting a million dollars, Hickson. He said, well, you and Horian are getting rich. He said, I want some of that. I said, you know, it was up to $75,000, the first prize. I said, you win, you, you become ultimate fighting champion, you get a check for 75 grand. Is anybody paying you that now? Well, eventually what his wife did, she pulled up wrestling promoters in Japan and Hickson went over, as you know, and did some work matches and a couple of shoots in Japan. But 
Horian was, wasn't willing to give me Hoyt at UFC 6. So I said to Horian, I said, uh, you know, Horian, we ought to get out while we're getting smart. He said, I don't want to get out. I said, well, well what are we going to do? We're going to wait until they close it down? I said, let's see what Myra will pay. So I went to Bob and said, Bob, you want to buy the company? Wow. He said, yeah. So we talked about it for two weeks. Bob came up with a number and I said, okay. And that's why UFC 5 was the last one for, for Hoist. He doesn't come back till UFC uh, up against Matt Hughes. He is 11, 11 years later you know, and, and loses to Matt Hughes. And Horian was done. Horian really didn't want to sell. I really said, we need to take our money and run. I saw the handwriting on the wall. Bob, two weeks after we did the sale, Bob calls me up, semaphore, says, hey, I need to hire you now. Well, Horian and furious that Bob eventually rehired me to be the matchmaker, to be the UFC commissioner. He felt, you must have had a secret deal. And I said, I swear to God, Horian, I, I didn't, didn't know that Bob was going to do that. I suspect he was going to need some help. But I wound up staying another two and a half years as UFC commissioner, January of 98. But Horian was done at the UFC 5. He didn't want to put Horian back in. He saw the wrestlers coming in. He yeah. saw the Severance, the Don Fries, the Randy Couture's, the Mark Cole. You no know change to UFC. McCarthy said it best. He said, Horace Gracie is UFC 1.0. Mark Coleman is UFC 2.0. Yeah. When, when the wrestlers came in and Mark invented ground and pound, suddenly the UFC moved to another, another dimension. And it, there, there's been so many different times when it, it elevates up. It was jujitsu, then wrestling, then wrestling with keep. I mean, it, I remember at one point early in my career talking to the guy I was training with, and I said, "Who in the world's ever going to beat Mark Coleman or Mark Kerr?" I thought they were unstoppable. I thought they were Maurice Smith. Lose. Maurice Smith. I know, but I, I, it was before that happened. I just thought these guys are unstoppable. You know, I, I, that was my thought. I didn't understand how it was going to elevate and Chris, how it was going to evolve. Chris, I'm very glad you brought up of, of that situation. Because everyone at the time was afraid to fight Mark Coleman. I was said I could never get could never get Shamrock and Coleman in the same event at the same time for the same reason. I knew he didn't want to get in the ring with Coleman. On the other hand, I was convinced that the first kickboxer, and he'd already done it. Maurice Smith had already done it for Extreme, and I was glad to bring him in, and he beat Mark Coleman. Well, let's 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 kind of talk about that. So, in essence, Mark Coleman you know, wins the, the heavyweight title. Um, and you guys, John Peretti's matchmaking at this point. And well, Peretti, Peretti, is, Peretti doesn't matchmake in the UFC until 98. Okay, so he did not matchmake Maurice Smith then? No, I I brought Maurice Smith in. Okay. There's nine, well, there's nine, Mike, there's nine <laughs> fighters that I'm very proud that are in the UFC Hall of Fame. And Sakuraba and Maurice Smith are two of them. Oh, okay, so Maurice Smith, out of everybody on your lineup that you could have Mark Coleman fight, you bring in a guy with zero UFC fights and a 500 record. I mean, I mean, very respectable kickboxer. Yes. You bring, you bring him in yes. without having any prior history to team up or to, to match him up against Mark Coleman. Yep. I was right. <laughs> well, I was right. Well, I, had the, the, feeling, I had a feeling about, remember when I finally brought uh, K-1 to the United States, I had Maurice Smith fight for me and Ernesto Hoost. I knew that Maurice Smith could, could kick and punch. And I knew what where Coleman was vulnerable. Coleman was a very complicated guy. With two guys that I was, three guys that I could be sure which, what version would show up. Okay? One of them was with Mark Coleman, the other was Ken Shamrock. I used to call Ken Shamrock Hamlet and Tights. Remember that he walked away from $60,000 payday in UFC 3. And he has an argument with his, his adopted father, Bob Shamrock. They don't talk for three months. His father wanted him to take that out against Harold Howard. And, and Shamrock stayed in the dressing room. The other, guy, the other guy who I had difficulties with because I never could tell was, uh, was the famous Brazilian, uh, Vitor Belfort. I mean, if Belfort was arguing with his mother or his girlfriend, I never was sure which Belfort would show up in the octagon to fight. For sure. Oh. And Coleman was another complicated guy. I used to talk to 
Mark Herman. I talk to him more now. So when I he worked with me, I could have a conversation with him and told him he would look at me. He couldn't really answer what everything I was asking him. He was he, he, for some reason I intimidated him, and I crazy about him as a fighter. I thought he was he was UFC 2.0. Everyone was scared of him. Nobody wanted to fight him. My idea was to find a kickboxer who I thought would have the key to unlocking the Coleman, and he, he beat him. Beat him. Well, okay, so grabbing the fence at this time was also illegal. But yes. If you, if you watch the fight, I wrote an article about this. Him and Pete Williams fights against Coleman. There's so many like egregious rule breaking in regards to against Mark that went without punishment, no verbal warnings. And then when Mark would grab the fence, it was, I'm taking a point away. I'm doing it. It almost seemed like Big John McCarthy was tilting the fight away from Mark. You know, that's a very good question. And the only one who can really answer it is Big John. Because I have heard that same uh, appraisal of that situation, Mike. And I think that there is evidence that it looked like on some subconscious level, McCarthy was a little biased towards you know, you know, that could just be the situation where Coleman is such a big beast and he's pounding people and headbutting yeah. them and doing whatever the, the other guy might be like, well, you know, subconsciously letting that. I don't know. Could be. Here, here, wait, let me let me further this because <laughs> Pete, Pete Williams. I'm sorry. Hey, I'm a Mark Coleman fan. I'm not going to lie. Oh, I love Mark Coleman. Yeah. yeah. So am UFC, I. UFC 17, Mark Coleman gets kicked in the head by Pete Williams. Yeah. This is the most egregious like issue against Mark. You've got about a maybe uh, 15 or 16 instances of Pete Williams grabbing the fence, including one where he looks like Mark is pulling back a slingshot with Pete Williams. And Mark, the three times he touched the fence, McCarthy's all over him. In UFC 7, you guys outlawed kicks to the face with shoes. Yes. Mark gets knocked out with a kick to the face with a wrestling shoe on. Yes. Oh. Well, you got to remember, Mike. The 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 early events, the rule situation was 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 very. But remember, my original idea was to do migration with only no biting and eye gouging. Starting with starting in UFC four, three, four, and five, we were under tremendous pressure. Bob Marowitz would call me up every week. He said, "What are you going to add?" Remember that somewhere between three and UFC fifteen, I added. Judges, weight classes, restricted movements, restricted, you know, band techniques, uh, gloves. The first guy to wear gloves was Mel Bowen, you know, in UFC 4 in Tulsa. Milton, Milton Bowen, uh, yep. Yeah, Mel Bowen. Great, great left hooker. Another a Sonny Liston clone. But we would, start, we, would, we would change the rules as we were going along. And remember that the guy who had to implement these, the guy who had to invent the job of MMA referee was McCarthy. It was McCarthy perfect? No. But he's the guy who invented the very template that that referees are still using today. Did McCarthy on sub subconscious level was he you know, was he might have been biased against a war fighter? It's possible. Uh, I think only six could answer that. But in those days we were under tremendous pressure to civilize the event because we were by Detroit, you know, they were looking for me on Monday morning. <laughs> you know, to me, the USA the Today newspaper had an article. Promoter flees Detroit. So that was the that was the attitude at the time, and I think that on some level it affected everything that we were doing with the octagon. I think the fighters were under tremendous pressure to keep up with what we were doing, the changes we were making. I uh, the, the fighters had to adapt more than any of us did. The, the guys who really created the sport are the fighters. The fans who stuck with us. In the early years when we were banned, really, and we were only available on community bulletin boards, you know, and they would keep the word going about the next, you know, event from uh, uh, that was in a video store, Blockbuster Video. The fans and the fighters made this sport. That's why I, I tend to discount my credit that some people give me. Well, you know, you created them. I didn't create MMA. I created a no holes barred tournament, which became MMA. But it had to evolve. And the fighters made the greatest contributions to that they had to keep up with the pressure that we were under for politicians and the press well i think what you were able really to do was i mean people had talked about it but you were the actual guy who made it a, a reality i mean everybody has our little small things that had happened these little events whatever but 
You were the one who brought to the forefront, had the, the idea of, hey, let's put this, let's make a speckle out of this. Let's make this something that people want to see. And, and that's what the big thing is. Like, like you said, yeah, it had been done before. It had been done in Brazil, been done in Japan. It had been done, but not to this magnitude. And this was the first time that it brought a lot of people's attention to it. And that was where I think your main contribution was like, man, you, you got this in the forefront of everybody and made it what it is. I mean, if you hadn't done this, maybe, I mean, it st still might be a small thing in Brazil or who knows, I don't know, but you know, I, you I do know this. The forefront. That, one of the reasons, Chris and Mike, why I decided after five that we could sell, I wasn't happy with having to add rules. I was really the, the NHP promoter and I, and I take full credit that with the rule changes we made, the weight classes, the, the rounds, the, the, uh, uh, the, the gloves, I would go to McCarthy and I would go to a Bruce, uh, I would go to the late um, uh, 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 Blatnick, Jeff Blatnick, and I would run stuff by them. I would say, what do you think we ought to do? And McCarthy and Blatnick would say, ah, that's bullshit. I don't think we can do that. But maybe you could do part of that. But we were making those changes. I wasn't crazy about it. When it, when it finally came time after my non-compete expired, in mid-1997, I was being approached by people about starting a, new, a newer version, going back to the original NHP concept. One of the guys that I was talking to was Andy Anderson, who's now in jail for 35 years. Ooh. You guys well, remember Andy Anderson? I, you know what? I text message him occasionally, actually. Yes. He, from Andy jail. Anderson, yeah. Mike, Andy was one of the guys that I had sent a business plan to. And he said, I got a lot of wealthy guys in Texas. If you ever decide you want to, now that your non-compete is expired and you can legally start something else, he said, I've got guys lined up. Well, he took that business plan and he sent it to Bob Myrowitz in New York. Why do you think he did that to you? He and Bob were very close, strangely uh, enough. But he and Bob were very close. Bob eventually uh, had a friend of his who was a judge who acted as a legal consultant. And Andy was offered a a five-year deal for federal prison and didn't take it. Oh, he had, been in, he had been involved in a drug selling proposition with, I guess I was a motorcycle gang. He decided to take the 35 years. He's still there today. Yeah. No, you, you, no you never, ever fight the federal government. You, all no, you do you're is lose them. you take that first deal and you try to get down a little yeah, bit more bro. and then you, you run. Andy well, didn't. Andy bro. didn't take the first deal. Andy took the 35 years. Yeah, I would have taken a person. <laughs> yeah, it's called trial. And, and what they'll do is they'll tell you, you got five years, you exit that door. If you come back in, it's it's like eight and a half. Right. And some people will be like, okay, they'll go and exit and come back and they'll go, no, now it's eight and a half and we're not moving. And yeah. it is. Yeah. It's yeah. the most corrupt system. And like Tiger King is there for 30 years. Yeah. Wow. Like as well, big of a goof as he is, he doesn't deserve to be there for 30 years. Well, Sorry, Chris, real, go ahead. On a different note, or I was just wanted to say that you know, when I first started fighting, you know, head butts were legal, knees to the head on the ground, kicks. And I was, I always ask, like, all the old school fighters, I say, you know, you were around in the old school days with NHB rules. What do you like better, then or now? Almost all of them say they like it better than. Um, I'm the same way. I don't like, the less rules, the better. It's pure fighting, you know. And, and people don't like knees to the head on the ground. But you know what? If I need somebody to head on the ground, they roll over. Or if you had a head, but you can't sit there and just hold in a tight position. It creates movement, which creates submissions. Um, it opens things up more. It, it's a less boring fight. So I think there should be, the it, the pure the purity in that is, what I loved, I love when you could head, but I love when you could do everything. There was there was more freedom to it, and you had to be a better fighter. You know, the the thing that a lot of people forget is that early on, I used to have reporters come after me with the idea that with the why why didn't we using gloves? You know that that the gloves you know are civilized. You know, the, you know originally what John L. Sullivan did, the London Prize Rules, they made it the Marquis of Queensbury. They went to gloves. I said, you pat a man's hand, you wrap it with tape and then you put a glove on it, it allowed you to throw a hard punch and not break your hand. The potential damage to the brain inside the skull is greater. He said it's actually long-term safer to fight with bare fists. And every reporter I told that to felt that I was a, 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 a promoter, you know, promoting a bare knuckle fighting and it was wrong. The truth of the matter is that uh, simply Sean was telling me that they've seen doctor's reports on bare knuckle fighting championships statistics, kickboxing statistics, boxing statistics, and MMA statistics. And boxing actually 
who provides more long term injury. See, oh, injury. So it's, not even, it's not even close. We told them, you know, that, that what we're doing in the UFC is safer. They figured, hey, you, you're just saying that because you're a corrupt promoter. You're just a corrupt yeah, guy. they thought you would say anything to get your point across. Oh, this benefits me. But no, or, even when I came out of retirement from the UFC and had three bare knuckle fights. That was part of my selling point to my wife. It was like, hey, no, this is safer. You hit with these, you're not going to take all the damage. My brain's not going to hit the skull 30 times around. You get hit 30 times, you're cut open. You get five times the hard, you're going to get cut open. You know, you're going to get maybe more facial damage, more scars, but less brain damage. And that's right. all I care about is my brain. You know, I wouldn't be able to talk at the end of this. So right. what are we worried about? Superficial scars or are we worried about brain damage? I'm worried about brain damage and all yes. most all fighters, all my favorite boxers, every one of them has brain damage. You look yes. at every one of them, none of them can yes. talk well. None of them. Absolutely. And, and it's bad. So I, 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 that's one of the reasons I encourage bare knuckle. I want people to go into more of the bare knuckle realm because, you can still have a great career and you can talk at the end of it. I want that to be the case. You know, I remember at one point I had a reporter, Dr. Ken Shamrock, and Ken tried to tell the reporter that punching a guy in the head with a bare fist is like hitting a bowling ball. The reporter took that the wrong way. You know, he he was he felt, you know, that the, he felt that it was brutal. And what we were doing was we were encouraging that kind of brutality. And I was trying to tell him that it's actually, you, you, you're you going to break your hand. What Shamrock is trying to tell you is there's a great chance to break your fist. And then you will, you're not going to punch that right cross again. But I, it's, I, I always tell people, on. okay, yeah, I tell people, okay, go hit that wall really hard with the bare yeah. fist. Now yeah. go hit it with a glove on. Which are you yes. going to hit it harder? You're going to hit it way harder with the glove. I mean, it's it's a no-brainer. I mean, like you said, that's a good example for a kid. Hit this bowling ball with your fist. No, it's going to hurt. Yeah, that's a, that's a skull. If yes. you let us go, you're going to hurt your hand, you dummy. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. You, Tank Abbott, the, he, him and his, his crew of people beat up Pat Smith in the elevator. I want, how do you deal with actions like that? Also at UC8, he beat up Alan Goas in, in the audience. What are those conversations like with Tank afterward? Well, you know, the funny story is the only guy who called me after Bob and I fell out in January of 1998 the UFC Japan. The only guy who called me, the only fighter, was Tank Abbott. Really? Yes. And Tank, uh, you know, and I remained friends for a number of years. Tank was a very interesting guy. When he came into my office the first time, he had on a button-down shirt. He had no beard. And I think he had no mustache at the time. And he had uh, some clothes in a bag. And he said to me, where am I going to show you what I can do today. He thought I had a fight set up here in my office or behind my office. So, you know, we don't do that here. So Abbott, the first time I realized, was a very, uh, would like to fight, number one. And he was telling me stories about street fights with Samoans in, in Huntington Beach on the street. And he was telling me that he and his father didn't get along real well. His father was a football coach. And when Hank blew his knee out in junior college, he and his father had a divorce. Wow. So they realized that Frank, that, that Frank had a problem with father figures. The father figure that he liked, though, was me. Because I and, and Frank were somehow hooked up on the same level. And I just knew I liked what he was and what he could do. I always encouraged Tank to do what he did, quite frankly. And I was sitting having coffee with uh, John McCarthy the morning after the event in Casper. And we were out at, in this little area right in front of the, of the, the cafe. When, when I got down to the elevator, who's holding Pat Smith in his arms is Maurice Smith. And, and Pat is bleeding from the mouth. And who had just been kicking him was Tito Ortiz. And Tito is just <laughs> leaving the elevator and he waves goodbye to me as just as I get there. He's heading down toward the other elevator where Tank is. They already went down to the other elevators and were leaving the area. So uh, Maurice basically saved him, I guess, from a, from a worse kicking, because they were kicking him all on the ground. <laughs> what, what, and, uh, and what, I what stayed, does Tank say? I stayed, what, in Casper. Yeah. I stayed in Casper until Monday, because I stayed there at the hospital. They took 16 stitches of Pat Smith inside of his mouth. Oh, that's afterwards, serious. Afterwards, I talked to Tank, and Tank went like this to me. He said, you know, he said, he said some things to me, you know, Friday night. They, they had a thing going on. It was white versus black, quite frankly. But I always felt the tank liked to do that, not because he was really anti-black, yeah. because he liked, 
You wanted to fight. Wanted to fight. <laughs> yeah, he wanted to fight. Yeah, he wanted a fist fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trying to push your buttons. He liked. He liked to, to egg people on, and I knew that about him. I understood that about him. The, the guy went. The guy who finally, you remember, the guy he had the right to let it to was me. Remember when he when 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 he, when, when he uh, insulted uh, you know uh, Elaine McCarthy that night with uh, with the Brazilian fighter. Which UFC yes. are you talking about, Mike? Are you talking about at the after party when he? Yes. Okay. The, the letter of apology was written to me. Okay. Yeah, Tank was a madman. He really was. Y UFC 11. Did you invite Igor Volchenshin and he no-showed? No, I was trying to get Igor Volchenshin and I couldn't. Uh, you know who had some control of him was, was Federico Lapenda. And I couldn't really, I couldn't really get him. I, Man. Really get yeah. I heard he no showed a, like he had a plane ticket, everything. He just never got on a flight. No, I don't. I don't remember that. Not no, no, sir. UFC 11, Julian Sanchez against Mark Coleman. He's a Mexican street fighter, undefeated. How how do you meet this guy? He has written letters to Black Belt Magazine saying that he has been <laughs> uh, he has been dissed, and he and Art Davy is trying to avoid, you know, having a real fighter there in Puerto Rico. <laughs> And you know, so I put it. So so I, I put him in the event. I put him in the event. You know, I was a great guy for it. If a guy needs to learn a lesson, in a sense, Paul Herrera got you know a lesson by Big Daddy Goodrich. Yeah, he, yeah, he really did. Uh, IFC uh, in Ukraine with Buddy Albin, the Russian show. Um, Howard Pe uh, Petchler is there. Andy Anderson was there as well. What what would you say took place at that event? I don't know because I wasn't part of it. Uh, Howard Petchler and I hooked up on X-Arm years later. And Howard, uh, he's not my favorite guy. Uh, and, and Buddy Albin had, was, a, was a promoter that I brought in in uh, Charlotte, UFC 3. He was part of his job was to help put more people in seats. He, not, not for the live event, the pay-per-view. His job was to just help me fill the arena. And Buddy was pretty useful, especially in Oklahoma. In certain certain areas of the country, in North Carolina, down south, Augusta, and Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, Buddy Buddy was pretty helpful in terms of putting people in the seats. Petzler, I did, I never figured out what Petzler's job really was and what he could do, but I had heard about that IFC event, and I there are stories about it. I wasn't there, Mike. Yeah, essentially they were trying to sell the UFC as a brand. They had to paint over the logo after the gig was up. Yeah, it's just kind of a controversial event. Um, UFC 14, and we're going to wrap up. I, I I know we've got a lot of your time, so I apologize. Thank you, sir. You had the you the Republic of Kazakhstan, uh, a, a representative, Pulat Mergalayev, there. What was the reason for bringing him into the event? I, I, for which, which UFC was this? That was UFC 14, Republic of Kazakhstan, one of, the, one of their members of Congress. I think we were trying to, you know, we were still looking to be able to see what we could do other than Augusta and, uh, and Dothan, Alabama. You know, so we were, we were struggling, Mike, to find out other locations. We were hoping, you know, and, and Bob was the first one to suggest that uh, BMG at that point was gone. BMG uh, eventually pulled out and wound up, Bob, Bob wound up settling with them because they really never got behind this event they felt that it had no business being in europe like germany hmm. so we were we were thinking about the kazakhstans the myanmar's you know it's, it's where you can actually the tourist money yeah no for yeah, sure you know all right exactly. I'll, I'll wrap i'll wrap it up gerard gurdo bit hoist gracie in the finals of ufc one the rumor was that the gracie family went to the hotel looking for gerard any truth to that rumor i don't think so okay i don't think so uh, the funny story is, is that Gerard Bordeaux came to the after fight party, not only the one on Friday night there in, in the bar that we took over, right at the McNichols Arena, but he wound up borrowing uh, a bow tie to put on uh, with his T-shirt to the to the after fight party. And he wound up lending something in the way of, 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 of a tuxedo to, to, to uh, Taylor Tooley. So, you know, Gerard was uh, Gerard was still smoking cigarettes on Friday and Saturday. Uh, and he 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 was he got along great with the Gracies, in my humble opinion. On Saturday, we all partied together. I remember cool. that when we finally went to bed, it was four o'clock in the morning, and I, it was me and Gordeaux, and I, none of the Gracies they'd already gone to bed. 
Man, I think if I were uh, around that time, Gordo would have been my guy. He'd have been my favorite guy to. Uh, I like his attitude, his mindset. Man, uh, <laughs> he just seems like you know, the, you know, the John, John, John Milius, the film director and, and screenwriter, uh, was a big fan of our event. He was one of the first guys that I talked to about pancreation being the inspiration for the UFC. And he told me that uh, that in the movie business, that uh, uh, they had a boxer. What was his name? Who fought Larry Holmes. Uh, it was in the movie business. Uh, I can't think of it right now. But he said he was the scariest guy I'd ever met. He said, until I met Gordo. Tex Cobb. <laughs> you know what? It was, I bet you it was Tex Cobb. Tex Cobb. Yeah. Rand Randall Tex Cobb. Randall Tex Cobb, Appar yeah. Apparently, apparently on the movie. Goon. Yeah, Goon. apparently Goon. on the movie uh, that they did about Vietnam, at one point, uh, uh, the, the actor Gene Hackman said to, to Milius, if you don't get rid of Randy Cobb, I'm leaving the movie. He said the guy Uncommon scares Valor. the piss out of me. Yes. Uncommon Valor was the name of the movie. Uncommon Valor, that's the one, Chris. And that's then, good he told Milius, he said, if you don't get rid of, of, of Randy Cobb, <laughs> he said, I'm leaving the fucking movie. He said, I'm gone. <laughs> That's so hilarious. Told me, he said the, the the scariest guy that I ever met beyond Randy Cobb, he said was Gerard Gordo. He said Gordo's got the soul of a of a UFC hit man. <laughs> Very quiet, smoking a cigarette. Our, our, and if he we, had to, he would just take the gun out. He would shoot you. No, no our, problem, we, David. We, we we did an interview with him. It took us four different people to get a hold of him with 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 cash involved in every single instance, and. He's either in hiding or calling the shots in the in the in the mountains of Portugal. Um, it is, it's amazing he's alive because all of his friends are dead. Yes, I, I think he, yeah. his his life on the street was rough, and he, as I said, the guy John Plus, the, the 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 owner of the Maguro Gym, got me Gerard Gordeaux. He died in prison four or five years ago, and they don't know whether it's a murder or a suicide. John Plus. So that world, that world of, 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 of Muay Thai kick fighting in Amsterdam, Man. Tom Haring, Jan Plus, that they, they were they were a lot they were around a lot of mob mobbed up guys. Uh, uh, are they the, the 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 Netflix documentary series outside of I mean I'm not sure if this is Netflix or Amazon or where you guys are releasing it, but that Dutch scene 100 percent needs to be documented. I think so too. Yeah. I think yeah. So too. Yeah. Let me throw a couple names and we'll wrap this bad boy up. Sure. Uh, Charlie Anzalone. Charlie Anzalone was my, uh, he was my, uh, my, uh, he was my go-to guy if I needed, a, 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 you know, a, a, any, any, you know, any fighter that I could use that wasn't great. Anzalone was my, he was my guy that I would call up and say, what do you got? Anthony Macias was one of the guys he brought me and Macias was actually pretty good. Yeah. If you remember that that bout with oh, Severin, where Severin dog. slammed him on his neck, but Charlie was my Charlie was my 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 go to guy on fighters that I needed to get on short notice. Charlie was at UFC one, and he was wearing a red tuxedo jacket with no tuxedo shirt, with his bare chest and the hair sticking out. And Charlie was a character, you know. He, he was a baggage <laughs> handler at the airline, and he was a member of the union. And uh, whenever I needed a, a tomato, I used to call him my tomato soup can guy. When I needed a tomato <laughs> soup can to put in the UFC, I would call Charlie. I said, Charlie, I need a tomato soup can. Who do you got? I love it. Did he get you Fang, did he get you Fang Maturi? Fang Maturi, is, that's another guy. And remember, he actually had uh, the incisors. Rest, that rest were, in uh, peace. And I, and I thought, you can't make these guys up. This no. is like wrestling. <laughs> And, and, and my, my eight out of 10 of them couldn't fight. My job, the one thing in I, Hori and I, and I always agreed on is that eight out of the 10 of the people who were going to apply really couldn't fight. The guys who could fight, guys like Abbott and guys like Gordeaux, you, you, you couldn't wait to keep those guys because you knew that you had something special that a guy really liked to kick ass. Paul Varlins, that's another guy. I mean, he wasn't the most skilled guy, but durable. Yes. Very durable. Yes. Um, here. Horian and Gracie. Horian and I had a great relationship, and we still do. Uh, Horian, uh, he he really wanted to do this, and I knew that the, the Gracie challenge wouldn't be the answer. But he allowed me to pick all the fighters. He, he never he never said to me, "Well, the guy that I wanted to get was Karelian from in, in, in mm -hmm. Russia." Wow, fun pride did a did a fixed fight, yeah. 
Yeah, and I and I bugged and I and 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 the uh, the, the the there's a there's a, a bunch of pro wrestlers. I'm trying to think of the, the brothers in pro wrestling, and I had approached them, and they said you don't have enough money to get Karelian out of Russia. You know, you had better luck getting Mike Tyson out of jail. And you would <laughs> but, Probably but, some but, truth but, in that. <laughs> when I brought up when I brought up Karelian to Horion, that was the only time that Horion said to me, "If you ever get Karelian, I'll make sure that Hickson fights." Ooh. Isn't wow. that interesting? Way. Wow, that'd Isn't been awesome. Isn't that interesting? Did, was there pushback from the Gracie family when you started bringing the, the Luta Livre guys over? No, because I was threatening to do that early on. La, La Penda had introduced me to Marco Huas, and uh, I wanted to get Huas in before UFC 7. Uh, Horian, knew, Horian knew the wrestlers were coming with with Severin and Horian knew that uh, that I was after the Luta Libra guys and I said to him I said if you're not going to put your brother in UFC 6 I said you're going to see Marco Huas and yep. I didn't get him in the 7 but I got him in a 7 so I mean yeah. the, handwrite, the handwriting was on the wall Mike the handwriting was on the wall Horian knew it was coming that's why at the end of USC 5 Horian I think realized I've done everything I needed to do to popularize the Gracie style of Jiu Jitsu it, it worked it worked it worked Okay, Chris, this Art, gentleman right you, here, man. Thank you for so much of your time. So appreciate it. Um, like I say, we've just been talking to a lot of UFC one guys, and we're like, man, we have to have Art back on just to hear this, how this whole thing happened. Because I mean, how many lives have you affected? You have no idea uh, whether you meant to do it like this or not. It's happened. So thank you so much. I appreciate your time once again. Hopefully, I'll see you again soon. Chris and Mike. A pleasure. My pleasure, you guys. Man, uh, our Thanks. absolute pleasure, man. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. We we've had a uh, we had a hell of a run in October. We we started with Ken Shamrock. We ended with Art Davy. We got two perfect bookends. That's right. Yeah. It was a great month. We were able to uh take the audience on a tour of the thing that changed all of our lives. UFC one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Art Davy, do we can you imagine Corellin versus Hickson? That'd be insane. That would be absolutely insane. And, I mean, that could go bad for Hickson for sure. The way Corellin would pick guys his own size up and dump them on their heads, does Hickson have a defense for that? Um, I don't think so. He'd have to go flying armbar. Yeah. <laughs> really yeah man, look, I'm a big believer in jujitsu, but that, that might have been too big an ask. I mean, <laughs> Hickson's 5'9", you know, 186 pounds. That's not going to go well. And you, what he, I mean, he submitted Mark Schultz. Mark Schultz, that Mark Schultz fight took place pre UFC one. We got right. that out there too. And yeah. he's, in 40 minutes, he submitted Mark Schultz twice. And Corellin is almost double Mark Schultz. Mark, I mean, not. Mark Schultz is a badass, Smart. but he is not a yeah. super heavyweight. Yeah, it's not super heavy. Yeah, for sure. Well, dude, we started with Ken Shamrock. We had him for an hour. Uh, you know, we kind of got that one by the skin of our teeth. Zane Frazier. Gerdo, Gerdo is one of our favorites, obviously. Um, yeah. Art Jimerson? Art Jimerson was phenomenal. Uh, Charlie Anzalone did not hold back either. Right, yeah, he's a good one. Yeah, and, you know, we ended with Art Davey, and I think we might be able to squeeze one more in. I've been talking with the G-man, Rich Goins. Um, if it's going to happen, it's probably going to happen Monday, Tuesday. So, I mean, it, we're going to record it after this. I wrote to uh, Taylor Tooley again this morning. He totally agreed to do it. And then I don't know if his long COVID kicked back in, but he kind of went radio silent. But I'm staying on him, and hopefully we can get him at the end. Man, our Davey, absolute gentleman. He and Sean Wheelock. Sean Wheelock is somebody that uh, I truly admire. If you guys like bare knuckle boxing, his fingerprints are all over it. Like, it's literally all the moves that they're making getting legalized in all these states the very fast rule set changes and understanding of what's taking place in the ring. Dude, Sean Wheelock's the man. And and him and Art, they're, they're very close. Yeah, clearly. So, Joey, we got to like, share, subscribe. We lost another 100 subscribers on YouTube. I'm sure it's our work, Joe. I'm I might sure be doing something work. wrong. I might be doing something wrong. Joe, you might have to either be in tank tops you might have to do shirtless for us. Yeah, I'll I know. Do shirtless. I'm a little <laughs> past my sell by date, but I'll, I'll do whatever I got to do. Look, if it's something I said, go ahead and write about it in the comments. They don't um, all have to be good comments. It, it, it is the algorithm. It's the absolute algorithm. It really is. So, ladies and gentlemen, 
you guys want to get in on something? You want to juke the system? Leave us a good review on iTunes. You, you really want to screw YouTube and put it to the man? Throw a comment in the comment section. Let's do our thank yous. Hong Kong Fooey on MixedMartialArts.com. Hey, guys, he posts our interviews over there on the Underground Forum, and there's some very detailed discussions. I put my show notes over there as well. For the forum members, it is a phenomenal message board. It's, it's for very jaded and very experienced posters. <laughs> if you're a newbie, I, I would be very careful over there. You're going to look stupid quick. Get some thick skin. Tyson Green, our producer, Joey. Yeah, oh, the work he's doing is great. He's taking us to the next level, uh, obviously. He's putting together the short clips. Those short clips get a lot of views. Not everybody wants to sit down with us for an hour and a half. So uh, he's kind of getting the word out with the short clips. We can't thank him enough. He's obviously also working for free like we are. So uh, yeah. you know, thank you, Tyson. Hey, hey, dude, how, how mad is the family at you for doing this? I just walked away from my in-laws. I'll be hearing about that okay, later. We'll good. see. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, me too. Yeah, the wife, uh, she's ecstatic. You know, not only am I traveling with BKMC, I'm also doing this. But you know what, dude? I could be at the bar. You That's true. I mean? It could, could be, be worse. Don't make uh -huh. me show you how much worse. It could be don't worse. Me, don't make me threaten a relapse. That's what yeah, I call Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you next time. Dude, dude, I can't wait to meet up with you in L.A. Hopefully, That's first right. quarter of the year. I'll be out there. Yep. Brother, thank you so much, Joey. Appreciate it, man. Looking forward to it. Take care. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.